Hello, good morning. How's everyone doing? Woo, RubyConf, yeah. All right, my name is Brad Yurani. I'm a staff engineer, uh, software engineer, staff engineer at a company called Procore here in, uh, here in Southern California. Uh, this is what I look like on social media. It's a funny thing, if you, if you do a lot of like tweeting and, and DevRel and things like that, you're afraid to like change your profile photo because you don't want people to like forget who you are. I really should update it, but I was a lot fitter back then, so I might just keep it, you know. Uh, I work at Procore. Procore is uh, located in a beautiful little surf town called Carpentria, California, which is about, about 200 miles north of here. It's sunny, it's beautiful. We're big, uh, we're big uh, supporters of the Ruby community. Um, we're not sponsoring this conference, but we did sponsor the last two Rails comps and a previous Ruby conf. Uh, we love these events. Uh, if you went to Rails conf, you probably saw our booth and all the engineers we sent down there. Uh, we build software for the construction industry. So if you are going to build a skyscraper or a shopping mall or a subway or an opera house, uh, there's a good chance you're probably gonna use our software. It's a full suite of construction management tools for building buildings like this. Here's one of our iPad apps that does drawing management for people working in the field. Here's some men using the iPad app on the side. I say men because construction has a similar problem uh, that, that tech does, which is it's overwhelmingly uh, run by males, uh, unfortunately, but uh, we try to close the gap here with, a, we've got a program called Women in Construction that we're really proud of that we actually uh, modeled after a lot of the Rails programs to increase diversity in the, in the tech workforce. Uh, things like Rails Girls and stuff, we actually copied some of those paradigms for a similar program for construction industry. Uh, we're a big Ruby shop, a big Rails shop. We have one of the world's largest Ruby on Rails monoliths. I know Shopify's got us beat. They've got like three million lines of Ruby in ours. We've got at least a million depending on how you count it. It started on Rails 0.95 in like 2005. We've got, I'm not, I don't think I'm supposed to tell you exactly how many, but dozens of back-end developers working on it every day. We, we deploy it four or five times a day. So we do Ruby at huge scale. Uh, and along with like sort of massive deployments like this, it becomes, a uh, it comes with a lot of ops work, a lot of tools and things like that. We've got a lot of this kind of stuff. Uh, so these are various like infrastructure tools and system management tools and configuration tools. Um, and I'll be perfectly honest, like, um, I'm not very good at this kind of stuff. I'm mostly a web developer. I spend a lot of time writing Ruby and JavaScript and Java and doing database infrastructure, SQL and things like that. Uh, but we've got an ops team and they do a lot of this kind of thing, these kind of things. And these tools are all have something in common, which is they're all very command line centric. You know, using these tools effectively requires good competency in your shell, you know, uh, Unix-like environments, uh, um, comf you know, being comfortable with SSHing into servers or doing things like that. And, uh, when I sort of got into this world, I was a little bit of a disadvantage. Uh, here's me in 2013. Uh, I did .NET on Windows before I came, long before I came to the Linux environment and Ruby and things like that. Uh, and so command line was like a little bit foreign to me. It wasn't something I was immediately comfortable with. Here's me in 2018, right? Uh, and now I completely live in my shell. Uh, I, I vim all day, I almost never leave it. There's really no difference to me between Windows, Mac OS, or Linux because I never leave my shell anyway. Um, so obviously something changed in those five years. Uh, something caused me to completely issue window environments and work entirely in a command line environment. Um, and that thing was dot .files. Dot .files is our, our hero today. Yay, dot .files, woo! Um, yeah, dot .files, right? Uh, so dot .files, these are things, this is how you customize your shell environment. Uh, and that's what this talk is about. This talk is about how to hack your shell environment, how to customize your shell, how to install tools in your shell, how to upgrade your shell, and just make it genuinely kick-ass and awesome uh, by modifying your dot .files. Um, and I'll tell you what, uh, if you start to do this, while this talk is mostly fun, this talk is mostly about tips and tricks and cool things to improve productivity and you know, make you a more productive and happy developer, it does carry sort of like a serious kind of message, which is that if you get competent in this environment, in shell environment, it does allow you to be more comfortable using tools like this. I like to say that dot .files are sort of a gateway drug to ops. Uh, that if you really get master your shell environment, you won't be so shy about SSHing to servers and changing configurations and building Docker images and, and you know, uh, doing stuff like that. So it's a really good segue from like a web development career into being more comfortable in systems management and things like that. Uh, so what are dot .files, right? Simply put, uh, they are files in your home directory that start with a dot. 
So, uh, you know, if you see the tilde and you have your home directory, mine looks like this. Um, and all these little files that start with a dot, they customize your system. They change the way programs interact, they change the way your shell works, they change the colors on your screen, things like that. Um, and uh, it can be really, really fun. You can go deep down a rabbit hole of changing these things and modifying your environment and learn a lot on the way, it turns out. Um, one thing you might notice is a lot of these are symlinks. More on that later. Uh, now, this comes with a bit of a warning. If you start hacking your dot files, you will break everything at some point and render your computer almost completely inoperable. At work. And it will be embarrassing. You will be pair programming with someone and find you cannot bundle install because you broke something in your ZSharp C. Uh, but you will fix it. And that's the key. If you're like me, uh, you learn about technologies in a lot of different ways, books, online classes, conference talks. But in my experience, uh, breaking things and then fixing them again teaches you the most out of all, and that's one of the things this talk is about, is about breaking your shell and fixing it again. Uh, and this gets addictive. This is an actual photo of me on Christmas Eve in uh, 2015. That's when I got hooked on dot files. Um, I was supposed to be visiting home, home in St. Louis. I was visiting home. Uh, supposed to be spending time with my loved ones and my family, and I got totally hooked trying to modify my shell environment and missed most of Christmas. Santa came down the chimney, saw I was hacking on my Vim RC. We drank a bottle of red wine together and both passed out. So um, you, will, you will miss time with your friends and family if you get hooked on this stuff. It gets addictive fast. Um, but anyway, let's start, let's start with shells, right? Um, shells, we probably all use a shell at some point. Uh, Ruby tools are very shell-centric. Rails tools are very shell-centric. This is a boring shell. I call him Larry. I don't know why he just looks like a Larry. But uh, shells, first of all, let's not confuse shells and terminals. If you're in Mac OS, for instance, you load a terminal, something like terminal or iTerm, uh, which emulates sort of a Linux terminal and emulates old Linux hardware from back in the days. But inside that, you have a shell. Uh, a shell is where you run these commands. Um, and you, believe it or not, you do have a choice of shells. So uh, by default, Mac, Mac OS and most Linux distributions use a shell called Bash. Uh, Bash is reliable, it is, um, it's well maintained, it works, it's a little bit boring, uh, and it turns out you're not stuck using Bash, you can actually change your shell. Um, I use a shell called Z shell, which is a little more exciting and it offers a little bit more. Um, you can see by this shell on the beach, by this beautiful California sunset, that's a little more interesting. Hopefully this sun, the sky is orange like that because the sun is actually setting, not because it's, the sun is shining through some thick plume of wildfire smoke. Pray for us in Southern California, good God. Um, but anyway, um, Z shell I find a little bit more exciting than Bash, and I'll show you why. Um, for one thing, it is very similar to Bash, but it has just, it's got some things that just make it a little bit nicer, a little bit more ergonomic. Um, I like, for instance, the tab completion comes with colors and sort of better layout. Um, you get nice autocomplete, like uh, there's like a little trick. Say you want a CD into uh, user local bin, right? You can do this little trick, dash U, slash L, dash B, and it automatically expands these kinds of things. So um, it gives you some slight, nice little things to have over Bash, but I like it because it's not so different where if you have to use a Bash shell, you don't feel uncomfortable, you don't feel out of place. You SSH into your server. It's so much like Bash you don't notice, just a little bit better. Uh, there are these shells too. These are shells from the 90s where things got crazy fancy and they have like sort of visual menus on the screen. Uh, and they're like sort of half GUI, half shell. I don't really use them. Some people swear by them. They seem a little bit out, you know, a little bit crazy for me, but your mileage may vary, you may like it. Uh, but you have a choice, um, I, like I said, I use Z-Shell, I think it's a nice balance between being similar to Bash that we're familiar with and being a little bit better. Um, and it comes with a programming language called Zish. Um, and it turns out to change your shell, you run one simple command. You type this into your terminal, next time you uh, open a shell, it will be Zish instead of Bash. It's that easy. Um, and it comes with a scripting language, right? Um, and Zish is very similar to Bash, so similar that it's almost the same, that most of the time if you write a program in one or the other, they are interchangeable. Um, I gotta be honest though, these scripting languages, Bash, Zish, um, they're showing their age, they're quite frankly not very good, they're weird, they have weird scoping rules, there are a lot of quick guns, easy way to mess them up. Um, for any serious scripting, of course, uh, I'm gonna reach for Ruby, as hopefully you are, but I tell you what, it is nice to know just a little bit to be able to do some conditionals, some if statements, and if you go hacking your dot files, one of the things you learn 
is just enough bash or zush to be dangerous, just enough to be useful, you know, where someday you're doing Docker files and things like that, and you need to reach for that skill, you, you're kind of comfortable with it and have it in your arsenal. So it's one of the things that I learned, doing dot .files is just a little bit of bash, right? Um, you can put these in a file, of course, um, but uh, what's kind of cool is you can modify your shell by, by editing a dot .file called zushrc. This goes in your home directory, and in this you can put all kinds of magic that makes your shell even cooler. For instance, you can add aliases. So I have an alias here, be, which runs bundle exec. Well, let's see, I've gone from my 12 characters to two. Congratulations, I just 6 x your productivity, right? You all deserve a raise. Uh, and that's pretty nice because um, you can just do be Rails console, for instance, like that, uh, and have less to type. A simple but effective trick for making your shell experience just a little better. I don't know what happened there, you didn't see that. Uh, right? Here's another one, uh, BERS, bundle exec rail server. How many of you type this all day long pretty much every day? I definitely do. Makes it just a little bit shorter to type. But in your shell, you can also do some other pretty clever things, like you can add functions. So here I made a little one, it's just called MCD. All this does is makes a new directory with the dash P flag, meaning uh, create all those like subdirectories in the path along the way if they don't exist, and CD into it. So if you just do something like this, it makes the directory and CDs right into it. So there it is, one nice little shell hack that just makes your life a little bit more er ergonomic. Uh, and we can do a little better than that. For instance, um, here's one I love. Uh, it just makes a function called G. Uh, and all this little snippet does is say, uh, if, you press, if you type G without an argument, run get status. If you give it an argument, make it git, and then whatever the argument is. Uh, and so all day long, I can, for instance, Let's see here, just type G and get my get status. Ah, oh, piece of cake, isn't that nice? Or I can G log and get log, and I'm just a little bit more productive. I really like that one. I think that's a great little shortcut. Um, it makes my life a little better. Um, here's some other ones, right? So um, this one's kind of funky. I'm defining a function called man. Well, you all might know what happens if you type man in your terminal, right? It pulls up the man page. It shows the manual of certain programs you use. Well, I'm overriding that. I'm creating a function that overrides that, but look at the last line of it. Notice it's calling man at the bottom. And then there's all this term cap stuff. I don't actually know what that is. I took, that from, I took this from someone else's. Dot files are kind of cool in that you can kind of trade snippets with people. More on that later. Uh, but whatever this little magic snippet does is it simply gives you colored man pages. Ah, cool. Nice little, nice little improvement here. All right. Um, you may have noticed my shell uh, has kind of a cool prompt. This is a default, just like boring prompt. Tilde, percentage sign, not very fun, not very useful, not very informative. Uh, we can do much better. For instance, um, the default is kind of boring. What's really cool is we put our git branch in our prompt, right? Even better, unstaged, staged, and committed files, right? Even uh, diffs between the uh, origin and things like that. Uh, and you might have noticed it, but this is what my prompt looks like. So we have current directory current git branch that we're on, the number of commits behind origin master from, uh, compared with the server, right? Uh, the number of commits ahead, in case you have committed something that's not on uh, GitHub yet. Um, the number of local stage changes and the number of unstaged changes. Well, that's awfully useful and awful cool. It took me weeks and weeks and weeks to write this script. It's a labor of love, just kidding. All I did was git clone it. Uh, it's a project out there, I installed it, and it's pretty awesome. Um, and it works, um, and it does smart things, like I think it background fetches that, and there's a timeout so it doesn't freeze your shell if it can't connect to the internet, right? Um, there's also a bash get prompt if you stick with bash, right? Very cool, fun stuff, makes me a little more productive. Uh, here's another tool that I really like, moving on. Uh, this is a tool called FCF, uh, which is a sh one of my favorite shell tools, which is simply a fuzzy find tool. Uh, it is first and foremost a Linux tool that I can, uh, pipe to and perform sort of a fuzzy search. Ah, cool, all right, so uh, kind of like grep, but for fuzzy searching, um, but it also can do some neat things like help me quickly find um, files in this folder. Oh, very, very neat, uh, right? Um, it's also, uh, I really like it because it, um, it, it improves my shell. You can search you know, like your command history really easily. Um, 
And when you dig into it and you dig into the docs, there are a lot of cool things. It is sort of closely linked to Vim. Uh, so if you are a Vim user, you can use Fuzzy Finder to uh, find things. Let me get into the right directory here. The dot .files repo, more on that later. Uh, but it helps you search your files if you are a Vim user. Now this is not a Vim talk. Uh, I could give a whole Vim talk. I would love to give a whole Vim talk, but I wanted to do a talk that everyone, because I know there's some not Vim users here, uh, I want to give a talk for everyone, but I do want to mention Vim um, sort of briefly because uh, this does kind of come into play with this whole dot .files strategy. To Vim or not to Vim? Well, there are, uh, for those of you who don't know, by the way, Vim is this text editor. It's from the 90s. It's purely shell-based. It requires you to learn all these, like, really arcane and weird text commands. It's like a, it's a text editor that's totally different from anything you've ever used before, and has a very steep learning curve. And there are three phases to learning Vim. Suffering. Right, uh, you will hate it, you will not be able to do anything, you will swear that it is the worst thing ever. Uh, Stockholm Syndrome, this is when you are held captive by kidnappers and after long periods of confinement you would sort to identify them and sympathize with your captors, forgetting that they are terrible people who are ruining your life. Uh, and then number three is the sunk cost fallacy. Uh, <laughs> this is when you have invested massive amounts of time in it and you swear and even though it was a terrible idea and not worth the effort, you've already gone through the effort, so you swear it was a great idea, right? It's, it's sort of like having kids. When someone, when a, when a, the only reason anyone has more than one child is that they forgot how much trouble it was with the first one. That's like what's happening when your friend recommends you learn Vim, right? You're forgetting how much you went through having that child. Um, but I will tell you what, even if you do not use Vim as your editor like I do, it is useful in knowing because Vim on your laptop leads to Vim on the server. Uh, and it is a great tool to have in your tool belt is to learn just a little bit of it um, because if you ever have to SSH into that server, modify that config file, a little vimfu will uh, really go a long way and it pops up in sort of weird kind of interesting places. Like for instance, did you know that if you are in psql, how many Postgres users do we have out here? Yeah! Someone asked me the other day, like, what is your favorite web page on the internet? I said it's the Postgres manual page that shows the locking semantics. I'm a nerd. <laughs> but um, anyway, you can be here in psql and you can slash e and pop up a vim terminal, right? Uh, select, whoops, no, quit, which is always the hard part of vim, uh, and it runs just like that, which is like a handy little trick. Did you know that if you were in less, right, man opens less, you can use vim shortcuts to search. So uh, control U, control D, page up, page down, those are Vim key command shortcuts. So Vim key commands, shortcuts, various things pop up in all kinds of interesting places in your shell and become kind of useful. So a uh, good tool to have, whether you use it as an editor is up to you. Um, anyway, psql, speaking of psql, because I already mentioned that, you may have noticed that my, P my psql prompt looked different than yours. Press, whoops. Uh, you notice I have my name in there. I've got local, which is the name of the local server. Um, you can edit that with a dot file, turns out. If you put a file called dot psql in your home directory, uh, you can change things. For instance, this little bit makes it so nulls show up looking like that rather than just a blank space. This little bit changes the prompt, right? So you know what database and what server you're on. So you don't confuse your local prompt with the production database prompt, which is very dangerous, <laughs> right? Uh, this little bit shows the timing at the end of every query. Kind of cool, so you know how long it took to execute. Nice. Uh, but let's move on to a probably more commonly used tool, which is git. Uh, there's a file called gitrc. If you put it on your, in your dot files, you can change your, you can do everything and completely hack your git environment. Um, I like this little shortcut. dfom, diff origin master dash dash color, right? That just gives us g, remember my g shortcut? Yeah, it's tying together, right? And there we go. Um, I like this one too, git lg, uh, which just makes you a nice little, whoops, glg. Oh, cool. You can kind of see it on the left, but it's actually just sort of like a visual representation. This isn't a very deep repo here, but uh, it gives you a visual representation of your sort of git uh, directed acyclic graph, right? Um, and in here you can do things like hooks. You can add hooks. Um, I have this little script. Uh, so hooks are, right, um, you can put little bash files in dot, dash git, uh, dot git slash hooks in any of your repos, um, and they will run, like for instance, there's an after commit hook, so it will run after you do a git commit. There's a pre-commit hook, so it will run after you do a pre-commit. This is a pre-push, 
script that I wrote. Don't try to decipher it. Um, before I tell you what it is, has anyone accidentally ever pushed a master? Yeah, right? All right, this is what, uh, this is what it looks like if I try to push the master. Aha! Nice, this is saving me a lot of embarrassment, right? Uh, and all it takes is a little bash magic and a git hook. Okay, uh, let's talk about Ruby. Ruby has a few dot files that you can change to change your Ruby experience. Uh, for instance, um, most of you probably don't use, if you're like me, you Google your Ruby docs, right? Uh, no sense installing all that stuff when you gem install, so put this in your dot file and it won't waste time when you bundle install downloading the documents for all your gems. Cool. Uh, RSpec, automatically add color, automatically run your specs in random order just by having this in your dot file. Nice. It was Rails, right? Every time you make a new project, you can have it automatically um, use certain options so you don't have to remember how you like to do your Rails new every time, right? It's kind of handy. Uh, but my favorite when we're talking about Rubyland is Pry. Turns out, does anyone use the Pry shell? Yeah, turns out you can modify your Pry experience in quite profound ways by using dot files. So uh, there's a file that's called .pryrc. It goes in your home directory. And in it, you can set up shortcuts. So for instance, here in Pry, by, if anyone uses Pry by bug, you're probably pr typing continue, next, exit all day. For me, it's cc, nn, ff, right? Ah, that's a killer feature. That is a really nice one. You can even install gems in your, in your Pry, right? So um, I use one called Awesome Print, which improves the sort of the output. If, you're, if you, you know, print an array or something in Pry or a hash, uh, they look a lot better, they're colorized, they're split across multiple lines. Uh, and just by putting this in your PryRC, you can make it use Awesome Print by default to print everything, which is a huge experience, in my opinion, in the Pry experience. Uh, has anyone used Factory Girl to set up, like, um, yeah, like fake data in your Rails app? You can use your factory methods, like, you know, uh, um, what is it, create and build, in your Pry if you do this. Uh, and that way you can sort of pull up, you know, demo objects and things that you can hack around on, uh, really with no effort at all. It's kind of a cool trick. Uh, and I like this one too. This allows me to just run a command called SQL and type in raw SQL. So from a Rails console, right, I can type SQL, select star from or whatever, and just run a SQL command and get the output right there. If I don't bother, want to bother with active record, and I prefer to write SQL. So lots of little hacks, lots of little tricks and ways you can improve your life by putting any type of crazy thing in your prior C, any Ruby you can run, any gem you can install, any functions you can create. Um, and you can just call the functions from within Pry, and in that way, like, completely modify your Pry experience. It's really nice. Uh, then there's Tmux. So uh, Tmux is a terminal multiplexer, and uh, this is one of my favorite tools. You notice the little green bar uh, down here at the bottom? Uh, this, is my, um, this is how I uh, run multiple windows in my terminal. There's a window, there's a window. Uh, and you can do splits, like that, uh, or like that. Uh, and have multiple shells on the same screen. Um, Tmux, notably, is a shell-based um, terminal multiplexer. So um, probably if you're using a terminal, right, your terminal can also do cool things like this, right, like splitting panes and stuff like that. You don't need to do this in the shell. Um, you might even argue that terminals do a better job at doing splits and windows and tabs than something like Tmux. But Tmux has a huge advantage, in my opinion, in that Tmux can be run on a server. So, for instance, here I am on a remote server on an EC2, pretend this is production, right? I can run Tmux on a remote server, and let's say I am hacking around in a server, I need to run a backfill in production using Rails console and Active Record to try to fill in database objects. Maybe I'm, I'm editing config files, or I've got like, you know, a psql terminal open or something like that. Um, you could have any number of things, um, and let's say, let's up the ante, let's say you're on an airplane right, with spotty Wi-Fi. Has anyone ever lost an SSH session and cursed themselves, right? Um, pop quiz for you. If you, pop, if you SSH into a server and you open a Rails console and you kick off that giant active record backfill and then your SSH connection drops, does the backfill continue? No, but it does if you're in a Tmux session. And the kind of cool thing is that you can lose your connection like this, then you can SSH back in Make that bigger. Uh, you can do a little thing called Tmux LS, see your open um, sessions, and then you can Tmux attach to session zero. Whoops, Tmux, all right. And get it all back. 
and save your session. In the meantime, whatever you've been doing has been running. So that's kind of a magic superpower that helps you a lot in ops land. Um, and for that reason, I use Tmux locally. So I use Vim as my editor, and uh, um, as I'm actually developing Ruby on my local laptop, I use Tmux because I like the skill that it gives me and the extra tool in my tool belt so that when I do need to run it in the server, I'm already comfortable with it and know how to use it. And in that way, um, modifying your dot files, of course, can uh, help you learn valuable server skills. I should mention that all the colors and everything are totally customizable of the dot file. That's where the dot file comes in, is you can totally trick out Tmux in the uh, kind of coolest ways with all kinds of colors and themes and neat stuff. Uh, so let's talk about GitHub, right? So what have we done so far? We've created all these configuration files. We have customized our environment. We've added shortcuts, aliases, and everything. We need to save these now, right? We don't want to just sort of like start hacking away at our laptop, and if you know, we get a new laptop or have to reformat it, it's gone, lost. Uh, what we want is we want to put this stuff in a repo, don't we? So here is how we do that. First of all, uh, create a GitHub repo and call it dot .files. Everyone calls it dot .files. Every single person I know names it exactly that, D-O-T-F-I-L-E-S. It's just called dot .files. Um, here are mine, so if any of you want my Tmux setup or my psql shortcuts or my zisharc or all my aliases, you are welcome. This is a public repo. You are welcome to go find them and borrow them and trade them. That's the kind of cool thing is you trade them like they're Pokemon cards or yo-yos or what do, what do people trade these? I don't even know what people trade these days. Jewels? Is that what people trade? Like you're trading jewels. Is that what teenagers do now? I'm not even sure. Um, but it's like, it's like trading, right? <laughs> um, sorry. <clears throat> um, so uh, once you have uh, your, public, your dot files in a public repo, you can trade them, and this is how you back them up. So um, what you need to do then is a way to install them. Uh, and install them is, okay, so uh, you've got your dot files in a repo. It's wherever you put your source directory, right? Wherever on your local machine that you, that you put your source code, right? Put it in there, create your dot files, uh, name them without the little dot at the beginning, so it's just like zsharc instead of like dot zsharc. And then what you need to do is symlink them into your home directory. So that's the trick then, right? We need like a little program or a script that symlinks them from the source directory into your home directory where they take effect the next time you pop open a shell. Uh, and there are a few ways to do that, right? I use a little program called RCM. It's from the fine folks at ThoughtBot. You just kind of, you know, brew install RCM or apt-get install RCM. Uh, and then there's a little command, rc up, you know, tilde slash dot files, and it whoosh, symlinks them all in. Uh, and then you open your, close your shell, open it again, and then you've got your whole editor, or, or everything is already there set up for you. And, and, and that's great, right? Because now if you have multiple dev machines, you have an easy way to git clone your dot files repo, uh, run the little script, symlink the files, and now you have your entire dev set up on whatever machine you want. You can do that in a server, right? You can git clone your dot files run a little script, symlink them, and now your production server has exactly all the same Git shortcuts and things that your dev machine has. It makes them completely portable, uh, which is a really nice thing. Um, this is RCM, right? It's just, a, it's just a very small, minimalist program that symlinks your dot files for you. Uh, you could also use a gem, right? Um, I was picking around my friend Megan 2's dot files not long ago. That's one of the other fun thing, is that like, a lot of your friends and notable Rubyists and people you follow on Twitter also often have their dot files. And one of the fun things is checking out other people's. She uses a gem called Homesick, which I didn't know about. Oh, cool. Uh, it's just a Ruby gem that does exactly that. It symlinks your dot files into your home directory. Uh, pretty clever. Uh, you can also write your own script, right? And that's sort of the fun in all this, is, is doing some of these things on your own. So for instance, um, I found this one in um, Jess Frizzell's dot files. She's a, a dev evangelist for Microsoft, does a lot of Kubernetes and things like that. Uh, she wrote her own little bash script. Uh, and I found it in her dot files, so all this does is loop through your dot files directory and symlink it once again. So however you want to do it, um, do it that way, but that's kind of the fun, part of the fun is learning to do this stuff on your own. Um, and with dot files, there are kind of two ways to go, right? Um, you can fork them or you can create your own. So here's Sam Fitbins, uh, Sam is maintainer of RSpec. He's, I gave this, first gave this talk at RubyConf Philippines and he's the audience, so I was trolling him a little bit. But uh, he forked someone else's dot files, so uh, Holman, Zach Holman's dot files, right? And in that way, there are whole sets of dot files out there, uh, and you can just fork them, make them your own, start to update them and install them, uh, or you can choose not to, right? Um, Sam has great messages, fuck it, restart it, <laughs> right? <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, but then you find cool stuff in other people's. So here's one I found, which is like, um, uh, this was in uh, Sam's PryRC, right? Uh, there's a method here called Rye, right? And uh, what you can do with this, I thought this was kind of neat. Uh, let me get back to where I was. Boo, JavaScript, oh, sorry. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I found this doc I found this uh, method called ry. Oh my gosh! Let me just do this. I think I can do this through pry. Okay. So uh, and it gives you this little magic ability. You just do this and you type ri, and you get the documentation for that class. This is what it looks like up at the top. Uh, sorry. Right. Uh, so anyway, what I did is I typed object.ry and it spit out the whole documentation for that. Uh, you can also do something like this. And you get the documentation for two string. So I don't know. Personally, I don't actually use this one because I Google my docs. But these are the kind of interesting and fun things you find when you start poking around in other people's dot files. Cool pry tricks and Ruby tricks. Uh, so the question then becomes to fork or not to fork. On the one hand, if you fork someone's dot files, you can get a full suite of really kick-ass working awesome dot files and you're off to the races uh, and you're ready to go. On the other hand, if you build your own, you really are in for a learning experience, right? You get to learn bits of shell scripting, right? Which comes in useful later. You get to make as many mistakes as possible and then fix them. Um, so it's kind of up to you. Um, there are whole repos out there with just links to awesome dot files and, and cool resources that you could find. Uh, I personally forked mine, so I forked the uh, thoughtbot.files, uh, which is a massively complex and really powerful suite of dot files from thoughtbot folks. Um, this is sort of like graduate level dot files, I feel like. Um, if you're looking to learn, uh, this might be a little too much, right? Um, but if you just want like a really powerful set and really just make your shell really awesome at the beginning without a lot of effort, then this is a great place. Up to you what you want to do. Um, one quick warning. Don't check in secrets, right? A lot of us have various things, SSH keys and things like that, right? In our dot files, don't check those in. Uh, <clears throat> what I do is I put this little snippet in my zishrc. This says, look for a file called .localrc, and if it exists, source it, which is to say load it. Uh, and then what you do is you git ignore localrc, so you cannot accidentally check, check that in and push it to your public repo. That would be a bad idea. Uh, so at the end of all this, uh, go experiment. The fun here is not only getting a better environment, it's hacking your system, it's breaking your system, it's fixing it again, it's staying up late trying to make the ultimate tmux config or the ultimate psql rc. Even though it's a complete waste of time, it's not really because you come out on the other end being competent in your shell, having better tools, having a new hobby, being able to trade this, and hopefully, possibly in the end, feeling more confident in ops, more confident in servers, building a little more courage, courage to experiment with other cool things that the command line leads you to, things like Docker and Kubernetes, uh, and feeling comfortable in those environments. So uh, thank you. I've got uh, a few resources here. I've linked to some articles. I will tweet these slides. Follow me on Twitter. I'm Brad Urani. I work at Procore in beautiful, sunny Southern California. If you like the weather here, come talk to us. We're hiring all roles, Ruby, Android, machine learning, security, DevOps, you name it. I'd love to chat with you about that if you are interested. We've got a beautiful beach view from the office. If you're somewhere cold, move to, move or, move to Southern California where the weather's warm and the forests are on fire. That'll go out, though. The, forest, the forest fires will go out, I promise. They don't last forever. Cool, thank you.